You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 297. Hello and welcome to podcast number 297 and uh, I thought we'd introduce this one with a usual bit of casual chit chat before we get into our feature interview uh, which is one that Andy did uh, this week down in London. Um, well let's uh, let's catch up with some some news. Uh, it's a while since we've had a bit of a uh, a chat, a bit of introduction to uh, to one of our shows. So uh, let's fill you in with a few things that have been happening. Of course, um, the TGO is started, and well, has started actually today. This is being recorded on the uh, 14th of May, uh, and the TGO starts today as 300-odd uh, people walk from the west coast of Scotland to the east coast and enjoy uh, good so- social scenery. Good social scenery? Good scenery. Good social life. It's all mixed together, really. Um... A personal challenge, as much as uh, overcoming the weather and the and the terrain. Um, but um, uh, as, if anyone's looked on the front page of our website, there's a picture of me the first first year I did it in 2004, uh, and I was carrying 22k, and I have to say I didn't really enjoy it, um, and I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. But by the time I, I'd got to the end of it, the social side of it had really started to to kick in, uh, and certainly um, as uh, as Andy and I have probably said several times, you can't help yourself you just get addicted to it so uh, they're all setting off and i've also put a link on the front page of the uh, the backpacking light website uh, of all the bloggers um, who are doing it i think there's about six people who are blogging or trying to blog as they go along which i think is uh, is quite interesting how differently um it will appear this year uh, because of that reason. Um, over the lot of last five, six years, it's it's gone from sort of no information to people doing diaries, uh, obviously ourselves doing podcasts, and then uh, more and more bloggers doing it. Um, and now uh, there's six people going to give, uh, as best they can, a live update as their trip um, unfolds. So uh, if you want a link to those and a distraction from uh, work activities, then uh, have a look at the front page, and there's a link to each of the blogs there, and you can see uh, their preparation as well as their journey. Uh, so that's the, the TGOC, and the best of luck to everybody up there. And yes, Rose and I are a bit jealous to uh, to not be doing it this year, but uh, it's one of those things we've uh, just got to keep battling away doing what we do. Now, talking of battling away, um, people remember I spoke to David Stevens a few podcasts ago who was uh, going to attempt to run the Land's End to John O'Groats. And we've had quite a few emails from people asking what happened to, to him, did he achieve it, um, obviously I, did I actually meet up with him, uh, and so on, and uh, various people who very kindly were saying... Um, what was his route and his timings because they wanted to give him some moral support and run with him uh, as he made his way towards Scotland. Well, sadly, he had a bit of a problem. Um, Unbeknown to David, he'd actually um, come down with a bacterial infection before he started. Uh, And this manifested itself on the third day. Um, He got to uh, Tiberton, uh, north uh, Dartmoor area, uh, and he was easily uh, knocking off the 60 miles a day in 12-hour days, no problem at all, he was telling me. Um, but sadly, um, he came down, he started being sick uh, and then got, um, well, went to an A&E uh, suffering from severe dehydration, uh, obviously from, from being so violently ill. Um, but he's recently had the test back and apparently it was some sort of serious uh, bacterial infection which completely scuppered his plan. So on the third day, sadly, after doing 170-odd miles, um, he, um, he had to withdraw. Now, he passes on his thanks to everybody um, who uh, was supporting him and interested in what he was doing. Um, he's realised that he's probably been pushing his body a little bit too hard the last 12 months or two years with all these uh, extreme marathons and ultramarathons he's been doing. So he's going to have a bit of a rest and he's going to give it another crack uh, next year. So, obviously, I've asked him to uh, keep us informed when that happens uh, and so that we can give him the appropriate support and this time try and actually meet up with him. It also gives me a chance to get a bit fitter as well if I was actually going to run with him which was a little bit of a question mark um okay now i've got a few notes here with me as you can hear um we've had uh, a lot of uh, a lot of notes in the last uh, few uh, few months really from people who um who've commented on the on the podcast i'd like to read a few of them out to you if you don't mind um and uh, just to uh, to appreciate them as much as uh, as i can really uh, i've got one here from roger brakel 
Um, I love your podcast. Keep them coming. Look forward to them on my drive to work, um, where I dream of the hills, the sky, and the smell of the earth. Thanks very much. Um, if you're still looking for suggestions for the 300th podcast, I'd like to put in a vote for a program about you and your venture uh, in providing uh, for the outdoor fraternity. We hang on to every podcast issued uh, from the station, but have little understanding of what goes into making all of this happen. Uh, similarly, with providing the link between the manufacturers and customers for the outdoors market, um, which you do with such a plum. That's very, very kind of you, Rich, Rich, uh, Roger, and I'll um, certainly add that to my list of, of good ideas. A lot of good ideas have been coming through. Um, hi, Bob. First of all, uh, make sure there are more editions after the 300th. Yes, I'm not going to stop, don't worry. As a trio in lightweight backpacking, yet to do this, I would like to see a short series of vidcasts on what you do, uh, on what you and other c- people carry in their rucksacks, an idiot's guide, so to speak. Um, that's from Bob Andrews, and that's, a, that's quite a good idea, actually, Bob. I've recently uh, purchased some high-def um, video equipment now, and I hope to be doing uh, more videos, but again, it's a, it's a time issue, sadly. Uh, Martin Fleetwood um, belated thanks for the podcast dedicated to the gear taken on the 2009 challenge uh, I was walking my dog listening to the podcast and nearly fell over when you mentioned my name well I've done it again so don't hope you don't hurt yourself uh, <laughs> normally I'm quite balanced when walking but that uh, did floor me but thanks again for indulging my passion once again sorry for the delay in replying and keep saying thanks and keep up the good work uh, I loved hearing about the Beth's Croatian trip as my sister has a flat near, uh, flat near Pula and I'm slightly familiar with that part of the world that was Martin and actually, Beth's had a lot of um, a lot of notes uh, congratulating her on her first uh, few podcasts, which has been uh, really good and reassuring, and obviously um, increased her enthusiasm to do more. I know she's very busy with her work at the moment, but she is uh, wanting to do uh, something. Actually, she came up with the other day, which was uh, quite good: um, uh, a gap year advice. Um, podcast and basically how to choose a gap year, what to look for, what questions to ask because it's, uh, it can be quite complicated for people who are perhaps uh, completely unsure of the travel marketplace so I thought that was quite a good one so we hope to be sitting down and doing that um, in the near future. A few more to read, if you don't mind. Uh, Peter Hiscock, um, great company. I found your advice very useful. Have no problem recommending your podcast to all my friends. The podcasts are great. Keep them up as they bring a ray of light when I'm out in the rain. Cheers, Peter. Oh, no problem at all, Peter. I've just got to t- turn my pad over. Uh, just a couple more here. Oh, yeah, this is quite uh, interesting. The Solar Cyclists. Um, that delightful young lady I spoke to uh, there. Just linked to the Solar Cyclist Part 1. Really enjoying it. Loving the environmental slant on some of your podcasts. Keep up the good work, John Hesp. Um, I've recently discovered your podcast. Amazing how you managed to keep up such a high quality for such a long time. Very enjoyable, inspirational and entertaining. Thanks, Fred. Um, and finally, James Thomas. Hi, Bob and Rose. Just wanted to say thanks for the excellent services. Uh, I am currently completing a master's degree in between work, so sunny days off are spent behind a PC. However, in your inspiring podcast, the excellent website full of well-researched pieces of kit helps keep me thinking about trips I have planned for when work is done. Not sure if you've already covered this in a previous podcast, but as a keen foodie, I would like to know more about the process of dehydration meals and storage maybe a backpacking like cookbook well <laughs> there's a story attached to that yes there is a backpacking light cookbook um, we have pretty well got it there it's about 70 80 percent of the way there and sadly it's been sitting on my desktop on my pc for longer than it should have done um, before release mainly back to again back to due to time so um We are planning to release something as soon as we can, and I'm embarrassed to talk about it in the same way, but sadly we're we're not much further forward than we were six months ago. But um, it is planned. Um, Now, of course, um, thank you for all those positive comments, everybody, and I I do hope you're still enjoying the the wide range and varied content that we sort of manage to cobble together on a regular basis or irregular basis. Uh, But, of course, there is the... um, Uh, European Podcast Awards awards looming uh, and it would be great if you could uh, perhaps uh, find a few moments to to vote for us and uh, here's a few details about it In 2009, thanks to the voting of our listeners our podcast series won the UK Business Podcast Award This year, we've been nominated once again, and we would love to make it through to the European finals, if at all possible. 
If you feel our mixed bag of podcasts have provided you with lots of free entertainment and information these last 12 months and would like to support us by voting for us, please visit the backpackinglight.co.uk website or the outdoorstation.co.uk website and click on the Vote For Us button. Voting is a simple affair and every click is greatly appreciated. Closing date is the end of July 2010, so let your mouse do all the work. The European Podcast Awards 2010, keeping the spirit of independent production well and truly alive. And so to our feature interview. Andy recently spoke with Ben Collins uh, in London, who this year is following his heart. He's left his job in London and is going to start to walk his way across the north of Spain uh, along the GR20 via the Pyrenees into a whole new career. And Andy explains more. One of the great things about the outdoor station is that all kinds of fascinating people get in touch to tell us about their plans for that next big adventure. Ben Collins emailed a week or so ago with plans for this summer that involved two of my favourite things, the Pyrenees Mountains and landscape photography. Intrigued, I spoke to Ben, who told me that he'd recently given up his career in the City of London because he found it both incompatible with his love of long-distance walking and his desire to become a professional landscape photographer. This summer's project involves a walk across the north of Spain from west to east before picking up the GR11 footpath at the Atlantic Ocean and following the line of the Pyrenees Mountains to the trail end at the Mediterranean Sea. To find out more, I visited Ben in his central London apartment just one day before he set off on the big adventure. Ben, welcome to the Outdoor Station. Hi Andy, nice to meet you today and thanks for taking this time to talk to me. No, thank you. I mean, I know what it's like. You're about to leave tomorrow and you're in the midst of all that last minute panic and packing. So uh, thanks very much. Now, there's a lot to talk about because really this is um, a live journey we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, but let's just start by focusing on the trip that you set out uh, to tackle tomorrow. Well, it's a coast to coast crossing of Spain. It'll be a thousand mile journey. It'll take me approximately two and a half months. And it divides neatly into two halves. The first half will be mostly a coastal route along um, using some of the pilgrim paths. And then the second half will be a crossing of the Pyrenees, mostly using the GR11. Now, you've been to the Pyrenees before. That's right. I went to the Pyrenees in 2001 uh, with three friends from university. And we did a crossing um, from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, a uh, six-week journey on the HRP, which is the high route Pyrenees. That's the route that sort of sticks along the border between France and Spain, and it's not always easily marked, but we had a great adventure, sort of wending our way across the Pyrenees, and I've never been back since to the Pyrenees, so it's, it's long overdue a return trip, as it's one of the finest backpacking areas, I think, in Europe. It is. I mean, the thing that always impresses me is that if you're into wild camping, you know, for me, the whole thing about camping out in the wild is part of the experience. Um, not only is it tolerated, it's positively encouraged, really. No, I'd, I'd completely agree. And there's so many unspoiled remote areas in the Pyrenees uh, that aren't as built up as the Alps, say, where you can find these idyllic campsites every evening, just night after night, and um, you'll find your water close by, you'll be have stunning views, you probably won't see other people, so it's, it really is a mecca for backpacking and wild camping. And of course you'll be walking um, the wrong way against the Pilgrim Trail. That's going to be an interesting, um, yeah, that'll be an interesting part of the walk actually because I, I, I'm, I'll be going against the grain. I think um, Nicholas Crane, when he, he walked across Europe back in, I think the early 90s or something, and he started from... Um, the westernmost point of Spain walked the wrong way against the Pilgrim Trails, and he he said it was interesting. He <laughs> he was uh, told off by some of the, the hostel wardens, I think, for going the wrong way and upsetting the pilgrims. You know, it was quite entertaining, though, isn't it? People haven't read that book; they they should do. It's a fantastic book. It's an excellent book, actually. It's called Clear Waters Rising, and you know that's a sort of trek on another level again. It's an epic uh, one and a half year journey across the 
entire mountainous watershed of Europe. So, uh, and it's a brilliant book, actually. Now, um, this isn't just a, a, a summer trek, um, albeit a spectacular in itself. Um, it's a, a photography and, and walking trek, and, and the photography is part of a, a life change, really, which is fascinating. So give me a little bit of a clue about actually how you're going to tackle um, the project. Well, I'm taking um, a digital SLR camera with me, a full-frame one, and I'll have a, a second lens as well. I'll carry a tripod, some filters, so I'll have the full um, gamut of gear with me, although I've, I've cut it down as much as possible to just the bare essentials. And it's just uh, the project is to try and record the landscapes that I walk through as I go. I haven't planned particular areas to shoot, but I just remember from the Pyrenees last time how absolutely beautiful it was on a daily basis. And I would love to have the gear and the knowledge now to do justice to that. And I, I would like to, on return from this trek, actually put together um, a set of prints from the whole trek that covers the trek from west to east with a with a story that connects the prints. Um, and I envisage it'll be mostly landscape photos, but I'm not ruling out taking photos of the, the people I meet and um, sort of photos of, of the, the towns and villages I go through. So we'll see how it works out. One of the nice things about Pyrenees is that um, um, you don't, you know, you can walk for hours and hours without meeting people. But when you do, they're just as likely to come from, I don't know, Nepal or Canada as they are from France or Spain. That's right. Um, on that, on my previous trip to the Pyrenees, we'd often meet people of all nationalities at the at the refuges in, in the evenings, and that's certainly one of the um, pleasurable aspects of a trek. And travelling alone, you 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 meet more people than you do if you're in a group and you're certainly forced to, to be more sociable and you're more approachable I, I presume as well so. now, um, there's a premium for all of the photographic gear isn't it and uh, there, there are a lot of people who are very keen on their photography listen to the, the podcasts um, I guess you know when I'm trotting along I'm really I suppose what I call you know super snapping really you know, the, the primary objective is the walk, get to the end of the, the day with a little bit of time to you know, take a few decent photographs if you get the opportunity. But what you're trying to do is much more intense photographically. And is that, is that going to... Well, I guess it has two effects. I mean, is that going to affect the itinerary and the speed of the way you work? And It's certainly going to affect the, the weight you're carrying, isn't it? It certainly affects the weight. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I think I'll have to... Uh, well, I, I think... I would still say the walk is the primary objective to get from the coast, the western coast to the eastern coast. Uh, but then photography comes a very, very close second, so I'll just have to stop whenever I think the opportunity is there for the photo I want. I'll be stopping, I'll be setting up the tripod if I need to, spending the time I need. And then the days when the weather's not so good or the scenery is not as spectacular as, I, as the day before, then I'll be, I'll be pushing through with the miles. Uh, and the days are quite long, obviously over the summer, sort of fourteen hours of daylight. So it might mean it'll mean early starts and then walking through to the evening sometimes as well. In terms of the gear I'm carrying, well, the base weight of the camping and what you'd normally carry on a on a trek, it's about eight kilos, which is not, I mean it's it's well seven kilos. It's light but not super light. Um, but then you add on seven kilos of camera gear. Seven kilos. Yeah, because the tripod itself is two kilos. And I know you can get lighter ones, but you, there's a line you have to draw somewhere. You say, I can't afford to buy more and more and more kit. I think one of the things that's interesting about that is that I, I guess over the years from from wandering through the Pyrenees, I have a funny feeling most people's ba base, rate is a, base weight is about 1.5 kilos. So, you know, when you see people clambering along with those big packs, you're probably not going to be far off that. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm sure actually. Um, when we went on our first trip in 2001, we... We, you know, I had, I did have an SLR, a film SLR, but that was it. I didn't have a tripod or, or um, extra lenses or anything. So the camera, and it was only a very small SLR. I didn't weigh much, and yet we had these enormous seventy-five liter rucksacks with the big full carrying harnesses, and uh, we, you know, we, we had these enormous rucksacks that broke our backs every day. So uh, I've really had to cut down my camping gear to, to allow me to carry this 
um, camera gear. It was, the, it was in the Pyrenees that I first decided there had to be a lighter way to walk. I remember one day, a very hot day, climbing over a ridge. It wasn't a particularly challenging one, and I just remember thinking, I am never going to carry this much weight again. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd agree with you completely. Uh, it certainly it takes the enjoyment out of a walk. So, you know, going light is definitely the way to go. So I'll be wearing trainers actually for the first half of the walk as well. And I've, I'm undecided yet whether I'll wear, keep going with the trainers across Pyrenees or, or revert to my boots. So, um, well, I, the last time I was there, I used um, Innovate um, trail shoes, uh, and I, they were fantastic. Um, the only thing is they're not as near as durable as boots and you need to replace them if you're using them but I have a funny feeling you'll want to stick to them yeah well uh, they're, they're actually a pair of um, carry more trainers and they're fairly durable actually I've, I've been wearing them to walk all over sort of around the city of London where I live for the last six months or so so they're well broken in okay well tell us about the rest of the gear that you're taking because um, obviously you you know it's a it's a lightweight um, setup so uh, just take us through the highlights of that well i'm using a go light pinnacle rucksack so that's uh it's about 70 liters 900 grams and it, it's very comfortable and it's sort of perfect setup for backpacking because you've got the big side pockets that you can quite easily reach while it's still on your back that you can pop your you know i put the tripod on one side the carry mat on the other and i can put my water bottle in there as well uh, it's got a big back pocket on the back for all my sort of the bits and bobs like your head torch and gloves and whatnot and then just one big single internal pocket which works fine for me because I have all the individual items then inside a uh, waterproof stuff sack. Uh, I'm taking the a Go Light Shangri-La tarp so that's about 600 grams and it just pitches with your trekking poles so again that saves some weight. Uh, I've got a, a, a RAB, a very lightweight RAB sleeping bag that's probably It'll only keep me warm to about sort of two, three degrees, I think. So any cold nights in the Pyrenees, it's it's um, going to have to be wearing the extra clothes. But I don't mind that. I, I sort of find I don't need a particularly warm sleeping bag on the whole. And I think, you know, carrying the extra weight's not worth it, especially with most of the route will be through the hotter, lower sections of Spain to start with. OK. Um, so you've... Uh... You've got your lightweight gear. You've got your camera gear that um, takes you up to uh, maybe uh, medium weight to, to heavy weight gears. Now, the, the photography part of, part of this is important, isn't it? Because you, I mean, you 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 really decided to change the direction of your life. And I know that a lot of the people listening to these podcasts always like to think about that. You know, or some of them are thinking, "Well, maybe I should have done that," or some of them are thinking. Well, maybe I should. But you were working in the city of London, and, and you you say on your website it's just not compatible with walking. <laughs> well, I'd also say it's never too late to make a change as well to anyone who wants to. Um, well, I was just finding that I, I was um, I'd been in this job for about three and a half years, and it was a, a very demanding job in the sense that we'd we'd often have to work quite late hours or sometimes weekends occasionally. And I had exams to do, which again ate into your, your spare time. And I, I just found that before I came to London, I was going to the hills, say, one or two weekends a month at least. And it dropped down to sort of five weekends a year, uh, you know. And, and plus a few overseas trips with my, with my leave. But I just thought, this is, you know, this is crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting this balance right at all with life at the moment. And... I, I kept reading all these stories on the internet about these people who are off doing their adventures. The internet makes it worse, doesn't it? It does, actually. It's terrible. I mean, not only for wasting time, but also just for giving you these preposterous ideas. And there's a, ch there's a chap called Andrew Skirka, who might be well known to some of the listeners, who's an American sort of backpacker uh, who does all sorts of fantastic journeys on a huge scale. And you only need to spend 10 minutes on his website and you're convinced that you, need, you, know, you start coming up with this ideas is what, yeah. and, uh, So I just, I just thought this year, you know, I need to just change my priorities for a bit and um, sort of indulge some of those passions of mine a little bit more. And, um, you know, one of the things I definitely wanted to do was a big trek. And the other one was to start to take the photography a bit more seriously and see where that would go. 
No, I, that's quite interesting. I mean, we'll talk about the website in a minute, but the, the, your website uh, is beginning to detail um, a lot of the preparation for this. Um, but thinking about that photography element, I mean, you, you, you've definitely set out to, uh, to to learn much more because, like a lot of us, I guess you're a self-taught uh, photographer. But you've been you've been taking advantage of some of the specialist um, uh, training programs, haven't you? I have. I've, I've um, recently come back from a week up in Scotland with Colin Pryor, and again, he's I'm sure he's well known. Yeah, very well known. So, uh, to the listeners, so you know, I've had one of his calendars for years now and always admired his work. And when I found out sort of the end of last year that he did these courses as well, I was sort of thinking, right, that's something I'd like to do next year. And, you know, I thought it'd be great to do that before I went on my trek so that I can use the knowledge and I've learnt there. He's a great um, guy for being up in the mountains at all hours of the day and the night. I mean, is that part of the programme? It is. Uh, well, and he certainly, I certainly agree. He's, he's, you know, his commitment to taking the, the photographs is immense and he'll be up there camped in winter on the top of a mountain. Well, actually not, often not quite the top, sort of near the top <laughs> uh, at the viewpoint and he'll be up there, um, take the sunset and the sunrise if, if he can. And that's um, something that, yeah, as I go on my journey, I'll see you know, I've got the I've got the gear to camp sort of wherever I like. So it might be that in the evenings I'll walk up to high points if the weather's um, playing ball, and I'll I'll wait for the sunrise, uh, the sunset, and then the, the following morning sunrise. I mean, spending a week with somebody like Colin Pryor seems um, a superb thing to do. But are there other are, are there are there particular benefits from doing that? Are there particular things that have really made a big impression on you? Absolutely, we had uh, it was a group of seven of us, seven photographers up there. So first of all, you just you meet a group of fellow photographers at similar levels and with similar ambitions, and you know, and then obviously Colin's there himself, and then his assistant was there, who's also a professional photographer, and just to talk not only, not only about the technical aspects of photography, but also about um, developing a vision for taking photos, and also about the industry itself. And you, I mean, just learned a huge amount in that week, M much more than you might just sort of reading on the internet. You sort of gain some real deep insights. Yeah, I, this thing about the vision is fascinating, isn't it? Because when I talked about you know wandering along on a, a trek, you know, taking super snaps as I call them, I mean, it is that vision I think that makes a, a difference from that to to something that much more special. Um, it, has that affected the way you're thinking about this trip? Or, I mean, is there a clear vision in your mind about what you're setting out to achieve in, in Spain and France? Um, well, it's kind of difficult to, to, to have in mind maybe yet exactly the sort of photographs I'll be taking. Um, because at the moment, since I've had this, the new camera, it's all been UK-based photography. So, you know, there's certain things I look for there, uh, the coastal landscapes... Um, so it'll be interesting going to Spain, seeing how I can transfer that across to this new environment. And so the, it'll take um, a while to find my feet, I think, and to find the, the, the views I'm looking for. And um, so it's, it's it's sort of op it's quite open ended, and you know will develop as as the trek progresses. Oh, it'll be fascinating to see the results when when you come back. Um, you, you mentioned you've been to the area before, though perhaps not quite the same route but I mean what are the what are the highlights that you're looking forward to well I just I the, the sort of one of the big draws is just this simple lifestyle so you know you can forget all your your council tax bills and you're paying the rent and that sort of thing obviously you can't forget them they but they're sorted out behind you you can you know you don't need to worry about them and um you know you, each morning you wake up and you just all you're worried about is whether you've got your food, your water, and where you're going that day. And for me, the photos I want to take. But I have to say that the Pyrenees are the, the more exciting part of the journey, of the two halves. But I think for for that reason, the first half will surprise me, and I'll find it you know as interesting because I haven't thought about it so much, and because I don't know what to expect. So it'll just be a different sort of scenery, I think, than to the Pyrenees. Um, but the, the 
the mountain landscapes of the Pyrenees are absolutely stunning. So it'll be fantastic just to be out there again and spending sort of days on end where you can really immerse yourself. Part of the idea is to do something with this narrative that you're going to create in the photographs when you come back. Have you have you got some definite plans as to as to how we're going to be able to see the the, the fruits of this labour? Well, I'll be keeping the website updated throughout the trek, um, uh, sort of as often as I can. But that won't the, the big phases I take on the the main camera. I won't be uploading until the end after the trek, and I'd like to then self-publish a book uh, of these photos linked in with a narrative that tells the journey as a whole so it'll, it won't be an out and out travel log novel but sorry not novel uh, travel log sort of paperback book but it wouldn't be a purely um photographic portfolio it'll sit somewhere between i don't know quite how um the design of that will work but i'll have a look into that when i'm back but i would love to showcase the photos primarily but but link them with this story so you'd be reliving the the walk through the winter um steve cracknell who wrote his book about the pyrenees i think if only you walk long enough uh certainly had a big hit with the uh self-publishing element and i must admit i was stunned by the quality of of his book yes i believe it's uh you know it's developing now into a, a credible alternative to the to the mainstream publishing and there's certainly a lot of companies out there i think um lulu.com is one i think that's the one that steve used and Blurb.com is another company that I'm looking at, and they do sort of your A4-sized um, hardback photo books with dust jackets, if you want, and you can sell them through Amazon. And so it's 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 not it's certainly progressed leaps and bounds from the old sort of where you'd perhaps order ten copies, you know, of dubious quality to try and sell to your, your sort of friends and family or something. So. Well, I'm sure it'll be a big hit when you come back. And you're going to be um, you're going to be using Twitter as you go along as well, I think. That's right, uh, tweeting or twittering or whatever you like to call it. Um, I know it gets uh, it sort of seems to polarise opinion between those who use it and absolutely rave about it, and those who maybe don't use it or don't understand it or don't like the idea of it and absolutely bash it. But I've found it to be. Um, you know, a really useful and fun way of communicating and networking with people. So I've been telling people about the trek through Twitter and I'm quite keen to to push that further because you know, as a source of information it's it's sort of rivaling Google now because if you if you um you're searching for a particular answer to a question and you're typing it into Google but you're not quite able to pinpoint what you do. But then if you fire it out to your followers if you've got a big enough sort of network the question might be answered with you know sort of within a minute or two oh, sounds, uh, yeah it's certainly all of the new technology is beginning to change very much the way we plan trips and how we move them so it would be fascinating to follow you um through the journey you, we've mentioned the website um quite a few times so um tell us the website address the website is www.bencollinsphotography.com because if you put Ben Collins from photography to Google, you, you'll get that. You should do. There's, um, it's, it doesn't come up near the top of the Google pages. There's a lot of Ben Collinses out there. <laughs> uh, I think the, the the racing driver who was Stig on Top Gear was rumoured to be Ben Collins for a long time, so he comes ah. and fills all the top spots. <laughs> I found you okay. But, uh, I'm there, especially if you type in photography and adventure. Yeah, and sure. there's, a, there's some samples of your photographs on there and also a link to a, a, a Flickr. A uh, small flicker portfolio, and the, the, it, it's good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a small but growing portfolio, and it was th- again going back to that Colin Pryor course I talked about. One of the the best things there was to get critical feedback on the photos. So some of the ones that were in there, sort of a few weeks before the course, are now chopped and into the you know must try harder bit, uh, bin. <laughs> I guess that's, uh, that uh, serves you right for spending a week in Scotland with a perfectionist. That's right, uh, absolutely. Um, but the, the whole website and the faces are all sort of a big work in progress. So, you know, I, I think um, by no means would I say that I'm uh, hugely proficient or anything. I'm still, I'd say, very much the start of this journey in developing the photography. No, I think we all uh, 
have to admire somebody who's setting out on, on, on this kind of journey. And is this going to be the pattern for life in the future? Maybe, you know, a bit of work back in the UK and then uh, and planning the next long trek? Or uh, have, have you sorted that out in your mind yet about where this might take you? That, I've got lots of ideas, actually. And, you know, it'll certainly be interesting to see this trek, how it develops and then what the output is as to whether it's a... It's possible to combine the trekking and the photography at, in, in this sense, or whether it's just too much, too sort of diff- comes on carrying all that equipment, etc. So, it's a bit of a, it is a, certainly a test. Uh, and I'd certainly uh, like there's few treks I'd like to do in the future uh, that would be, you know, possibly some longer ones like the American trails. Um, whether I'd just do them as a, a trek alone or with the, ph- the photography, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but I could see myself doing, yeah, in, in between treks going back to perhaps stints in the city on contract work if I can, if I can arrange that and to fund you know the next journey so well good luck with the journey and good luck with the future and uh, maybe we'll get uh, some space to chat when you come back well thank you very much Andy that would be uh, I'd be delighted to talk to you again when I get back so okay well have a good trip Ben thank you very much thank you as Ben said there in the interview, you can find out more by visiting his website on www.bencollinsphotography.com. That's Ben Collins Photography, all one word. There you'll find his blog that details the preparations for the trip, a link to his Twitter feed that will be updated as he moves along the mountain chain, and some wonderful examples of Ben's photographic work. We hope to speak to Ben at the end of the walk sometime during the autumn. And that brings us to the end of number 297. Thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. I hope you've enjoyed the rich and varied smorgasbord of podcasts we've produced. And as I say, if you do have time, we'd greatly appreciate it if you click that button and vote for us on the European Podcast Awards. Uh, We've got lots of uh, ideas for podcasts and certainly many suggestions that have come in from everybody, so thank you very much for those. Uh, We are struggling, like uh, most people at the moment, in really just finding the time to do it all. But we are working hard to uh, try and do a full day's work and also keep the podcast going because there is a certain amount of escapism involved and it's always interesting to talk to other people who are doing uh, a variety of outdoor activities. There's always something that can be learned. So we'll keep this rich and varied podcast series going as much as we can and keep it coming as irregular or as regular as we could possibly make it. Anyway, the, uh, I'm staring across the fields at the moment. They're looking beautifully lush and uh, the weather is getting much more enticing. So let's all get out, try and enjoy life a bit more and hopefully we'll see you somewhere along the way. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear more from our extensive free library, please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. You can now follow The Outdoor Station on Facebook, where we chat about each programme we produce, answer questions and discuss future productions. Why not join us there? This podcast is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk. 